Okay, so Brian, before we start, I don't know if everybody here in the audience knows you, because as Yolanda said, Brian is a professor of law, of law at the University of Manitoba, but that's not enough for him. He also is doing a million other really interesting projects, one of which is Mishpatim, which is a program where he invites law students, Jewish and non-Jewish, from all the law schools over Canada, to go to Israel for a month and to be there as guests of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, the program is sponsored by the Esper Foundation, and therefore it is not very expensive. And there people learn firsthand what Israel is all about. They hear all these interesting Israeli professors who, you know, have all these brilliant ideas. They live on the campus, they tour the country, go to the Israeli High Court, go to the Knesset, visit all these important places of policy making, a really interesting program. And then, of course, he also writes musicals, because why not, right? So he has published... Someone has to. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he has uh, written a musical, I think it is four years ago, Constellation? Yeah. Constellation, and you spell it C-O-N-S-O-U-lation. And it's just, it was actually the story of your life. And you wrote the poetry for it, you wrote the songs for it, and you are working on another musical, that we are hoping will go in production very soon. So, and then he writes books, and then sometimes he also practices law, and tonight he is here. So the book that he has been working on, he has been working on it, of course, long in advance of October the 7th, but it was quite serendipitous that it came out now, at this particular time. So it is called Re-Enlightening Canada, and it is basically putting the lights back on in Canada. So, uh, Brian, I want to ask you, I was on campus this afternoon observing and monitoring a pro-Palestinian demonstration. I've done so last Monday, and last Friday we had this infamous teach-in at the University of Winnipeg, with which I am not ready yet at all. Other than that, what is going on on campuses lately for Jewish students and Jewish staff? Well, first of all, we have to ask, if we ask this question in 10 years, what Jewish students, what Jewish faculty? At least there's some Jewish faculty left to be harassed and intimidated. At least there's still some Jewish students going to universities. But what's happening now is the product of toxic forces that have been forming and have been visible for a very long time. If people were paying attention, the arc of history is not tending in favor of Jewish survival. It's tending towards the demoralization of Jews in the diaspora. It's tending towards a heightening of the physical threat to the existence of Jews in Israel. Uh, one of the projects I'm working on is the Passover Seder. It's about time. It's about time. So I just noticed once, if you look at the Haggadah, the narrative that goes with the Passover Seder, there's some references to time. And I thought I read a little blog piece at the Times of Israel. Uh, you know, maybe there's eight dimensions of time in the Passover Seder. Uh, my latest draft was 99 dimensions of time in the Passover Seder. And I talked about Jewish time, which means late. Uh, that's the joke. Jewish time means you show up late. The Jewish time is much later than you think. The condition of Jewish civilization is severely in peril. One of the major points tending towards the destruction of what's left of the Jewish people is the state of universities. Re-enlightening Canada, the title, Re-enlightening, is about how we should actually live up to the best traditions of what universities are supposed to be. A university is supposed to be a place where you enter the university on the basis of your individual talent and your commitment to study and your excellence in scholarship. It is only under those conditions that Jews have been able to thrive in the academy. Those are not the current conditions. The current conditions are a move away from enlightenment values, away from everybody is equal as an individual, away from tolerance of 
viewpoint diversity. It is towards an enforcement of an ideology. The ideology is intolerant. The ideology is hostile to free expression. The ideology is hostile to the participation of Jews in the academic enterprise. Could I stop you there for a second? Because when you talk about ideology, uh, I think the ideology that you are referring to is what is called DEI, or diversity, equity, and inclusion. Now, if you ask me, uh, I'm playing a little bit dumb here, but if you ask me, those are all good things, right? Diversity, equity, and inclusion. So what do these things mean, and how, do, how, do, how have they become an uh, ideology that you would describe as toxic? Well, if you break it down into individual components, who's in favor, of, who's against any of them? Mm -hmm. Well, let's break it down. What does inclusion mean? Inclusion should mean equal opportunity for everyone. And that does not mean merely formal equality. You have to take into account some people have challenges and obstacles. And part of the Enlightenment project, as we've learned, is being sensitive to those. But inclusion is supposed to mean in a university the inclusion of people with different viewpoints. Right now, inclusion means you are free to speak, except no one gets to participate and get a job at a university and thrive at a university unless you belong to the ideology of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Increasingly, you have to sign a DIE statement how committed am I to this ideology is what it means in effect. If you happen to be a pro-Jewish Jew, I am. If you happen to think that Jews have the same right to self-determination as everyone else, that is not a career-enhancing position to take. It may, in fact, be disqualifying. But why aren't you being included if you say I'm a self-affirming Jew, like somebody else can be a self-affirming Chinese uh, professor of law? Uh, why don't they like you, and why don't they want you, at, or people like you, at the universities, and similarly students? Well, as comedian and social critic David Batio, the title of his book is Jews Don't Count. Good book, by the way. In the ideology of diversity, equity, inclusion, Jews at best don't count. At worst, Jews are white. Jews are privileged. Uh, Jews are part of the structure of white hegemony. So you can get away with being an anti-Jewish Jew. You can use locutions like, I'm of Jewish extraction. You can be a Jew, but I'm a Jew, but I don't support Israel. Uh, but try being a Jewish Jew. It doesn't help you. So it may, in fact, be disqualifying. So it is, uh, we are being accused of being white. Um, Jews are not white, but hey, we are white in the eyes of these people, and we are rich. So it is about the color of your skin and the size of your bank account, and it is not about academic rigor and hard work, as you say. Yeah, so uh, Jews are white. Okay, my pigmentation is what it is, I don't consider myself white, I consider myself Jewish. Mm -hmm. And the Nazis did not think I was white enough. In the state of Israel, there are more Jews of Sephardic, Mizrahi, and Ethiopian ancestry than there are Jews from Europe. So how white is that? All these experts on this super white supremacy, you don't even know where the Jews of Israel came from. More of them were ethnically cleansed from the surrounding Arab and Islamic community than the survivors of Europe. The survivors of Europe, they're white, they're a continuation of European settler domination. Well, how come they chose the national language of Israel to be Hebrew? Not German, not Polish, not English, because they were escaping from Europe, because they were the indigenous people of Israel seeking to reestablish themselves. And by the way, many Jews in Israel are descended from people who never left. There has been a continuous Jewish presence in Israel for 3,000 years 
or more. If you want to follow a cartoon ideology of dividing the world by groups, you're this or you're that, you're racist or you're anti-racist. We, ideology of DEI, oh, you're free to lump somebody who's born with Japan with somebody who was born in South America with an Ethiopian Jew, if you acknowledge the existence of Jews, which DEI people tend not to in any kind of positive way. I don't know, that sounds pretty racist to me. Whatever happened to the Enlightenment ideal that first and foremost, as Martin Luther King said, we judge people by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. So it is not helpful to be Jewish anymore, but you can be portrayed, caricatured, dismissed as part of the rich folks, the privileged folks, the white folks, and everyone has a right to self-determination except the Jews, because that's toxic. That is the ideology of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Could you give some uh, really concrete examples of that you have experienced yourself or that you know that student, Jewish students have experienced at the university? So what does it boil down to in practical terms in real life? Well, what are the things that you have encountered? <laughs> Naming no names, but... Well, <laughs> we don't have enough time to, <laughs> to do the catalog. Uh, several years ago, my union, which I'm compulsorily belonged to, to contribute to and acts as my only exclusive representative, all of a sudden brought a motion that my union would oppose the ERA definition, the internationally accepted definition of anti-Semitism by anyone, anywhere. All of a sudden, they would say, as he would say in Hebrew, Sati came for free speech. We were so worried that this anti-Semitism anti initiative was going to infringe on their free speech, they were going to oppose the use of it by anyone, anywhere, which would have included the Prime Minister of Canada, because the government of Canada has adopted the era definition. It would now include anyone propounding the official position of the Manitoba legislature, which unanimously adopted the ERA resolution as a non-binding concept, is there any other ethnic group where the first reaction was, let us ban this measure that seeks to protect you? Is there any other ethnic group that they would do with? Is there any other group that they would feel free to do that with? And when the Jewish Federation asked to speak at the UMFA meeting, that's my union, they were told, no, there's not enough time. Go back to my concept. It's later than you think, folks. When the Jewish Federation was told, not enough time to even allow a representative of the mainstream community to participate, that should have been a code red. How could I possibly feel at home at a university where the union, without listening to the representatives of the Jewish community, the mainstream Jewish community, without any kind of due process, putting forward completely biased information, stacking a meeting with people who are already on record in the majority as opposing era, how am I supposed to feel safe or at home there? Now, I'm a contrarian. i constantly taking on whoever's in power. I'm a perennial supporter of the underdog. I've spent my life as a sports fan cheering for the team that almost always loses, because I always cheer. Toronto Maple Leafs? For the underdogs, <laughs> sure. <laughs> Uh, so, I've had my scraps with management. I'm anti-authoritarian. I believe in checks and balances. I believe that my job actually requires me to speak forthrightly. So, I'm supposed to take on management, and I'm supposed to, the people backing me up are people who pulled off this stunt that they would do to no other group that would lack the slightest semblance of rationality or due process. It's not a safe environment for me to do what I do. I'm just doing it anyway. I can go into why I keep doing this. But well, uh, when I'm listening to you, to. I uh, was thinking about a book that you mentioned earlier, John Babio, and uh, Jews Don't Count. You should really read the book, because in a similar situations, this was now about Jews and the definition, the IRA definition of anti-Semitism. Just think for a moment that it would have been uh, Asians and the definition of Asian hate. And then you talk, of the, the faculty union talks about uh, us, Jews, without talking to us. So in a, in the case of another minority group, 
how would they have gotten away with it, talking about Asians without talking to Asians about Asians? So, but for Jews, as John Daniel says, Jews don't count. And the example that you give is a pretty good illustration of that. Same thing, by the way, happened at the University of Winnipeg. And I'm in a very difficult position that I'm a strong supporter of free speech. Mm -hmm. So if you ask me, should you be able to have a university position and selectively condemn Israel? Yeah, I believe in academic freedom. I'm quite a maximalist on academic freedom, so I've said so in my book, yeah. But other people should have the right to call you out. Other people should be able to say, you know, if you look at the era definition, your selective condemnation of Israel, your denial of the right of the Jewish people to self-determination, the way you treat um, anti-discrimination methods with respect to the Jewish people is anti-Semitic, or as we should be saying, is Jew hatred. Because mm -hmm. uh, we should put it in the plain terms that it is. How do you get away with it? Why don't Jews count? Because there's not a lot of Jews to count. So that's also something that you talk about in your book. You talk about the erasure of Jews from higher education. Um, surely it cannot be that bad? Yeah, it's that bad. But let's go back to how do you get away with it. Um, yeah, the only group that's singled out for being power and privileged, which is actually in an extremely vulnerable position. There is a worldwide shortage of Jews. Thank you, Western civilization. Thank you, rest of the world. But there's very few Jews left. There was never a lot of Jews. In the Bible, God says, I'm choosing you not because you're the biggest people, but mm -hmm. because you're the smallest people. There are not many of us left. Uh, ratio of Jews in the world to Christians, one to 100. Jews to Muslims, one to 100. 0.2% of the world population. A dwindling percentage of the Canadian population. You know what? You can win a Canadian election without supporting Israel. You could win a Canadian election without having any respect for the Jewish community. The myth is, oh, we're so powerful. No, Jewish people have been very accomplished, but never particularly powerful. And certainly not powerful now, not powerful in terms of any measure you would want to make, except one remaining measure, which is accomplishment. You can count Jewish Nobel Prizes, you can count the Jewish contribution to the arts, to the sciences, to humanities. To me medicine, which is very significant, sometimes gives people an outsized sense of how many Jews are left, but the answer is very few. So when there's very few Jews to count, it's very easy to say that Jews don't count. What difference does it make to the people in power? You know, the d diversity, equity, and inclusion people are always interrogating power. Well, go interrogate yourself. Go ask yourself why you keep doing this to Jewish students, Jewish faculty, why you have a contemptuous attitude towards the Jewish homeland. It's not hurting you, it's a very popular view. And it's very career enhancing. The DEI educational complex is big business. My alma mater, one of them, is Yale. There's more administrators there than our faculty. My late friend Norm Larson used to say you can make a lot of money in poverty law. You can make a lot of money, you can go very far in your career by adopting a particular ideology, which is hostile to Jews and hostile to the survival of the Jewish people, and portray yourself as a heroic. As I keep saying, why don't you folks try to do something difficult? You want to be a champion of a minority? You want to actually challenge power? Why don't you think about whether there's going to be any Jews left in the foreseeable future? That brings me to another point, because uh, you say we don't have power, we don't, I agree with you. On the other hand, there are many Jewish who are, Jews, sorry, who are big donors to academic causes. You know, um, the Ravi Health Science faculty, uh, other uh, large parts of the university are being uh, funded by, by Jewish donors. I also got a lot of letters on Tuesday, which was Giving Tuesday, from ex people, from people who had studied at the University of Winnipeg who told me, Ruth, I'm not going to make a donation anymore. So, what is your view on that? Uh, in the United States, we have seen that some big Jewish donors have turned away from uh, Pennsylvania State University, for instance, from Harvard. Um, any comments on that? Yeah, there seems to be some Jewish donors who are having their Colonel Nicholson moment. At the end of Bridge on the River Kwai, Colonel Nicholson suddenly realizes he got so obsessed with building the bridge he lost sight of which side he's on in the war with Imperial Japan. And his last words are, what have I done? I have no question about the good faith 
of Jewish donors who have given to universities in the belief that it's a place where there's a intellectual pluralism, or that are promoting academic excellence, that are seeking to improve the conditions of humanity. Uh, this is all admirable. Uh, but what they haven't realized, and I don't know how many of them have yet figured it out, is what's actually going on in the university. You went to a university, you were a successful lawyer or doctor, do you think your grandson or granddaughter is gonna be able to pass a DEI ideological litmus test? In fact, the very things that you did in your life, you struggled against discrimination, you struggled against obstacles, you became a highly successful business person. You became a highly successful doctor, you became a highly successful lawyer. Do those conditions exist for your grandchildren? You gotta sign a DEI statement. Oh, let me see, my struggles in life are, oh, geez, this is embarrassing, I'm Jewish. Uh, let's see, went to a Jewish summer camp. I, I volunteered in Israel for some good cause. I gotta admit, my family's fairly prosperous. Not helping you. Mm -hmm. So where do you think your grandchildren are going to thrive in the same way that you thrive? And by the way, where is the next generation of Jews coming from? In the city of Winnipeg, it should not be financially challenging to be committed to Judaism. It should not be a challenge for a family to have to pay a large part of their income to send their kids to a Jewish day school or to maintain a kosher lifestyle or belong to a synagogue. So my suggestion is Jewish donors should think in terms to some extent of Jewish specificity. In other words, there's lots of people who can contribute to universities. Um, governments of China and Qatar are doing a fine job. <laughs> you could spend some of your energy and goodwill on ensuring that there's actually a vibrant Jewish community that's going to persist in the century that we were living in. Another suggestion I would make is there should be a certification called free universities. Jewish donors should only give to universities that are free universities, which means that they believe in free speech, that they hire on the basis of academic excellence and not ideological conformity, and in which Jewish students, like any students, can feel comfortable learning and not living in a hostile and demeaning environment. That would be voluntary, but people would get together to find the certain parameters of what a Jewish, what a free university is, and Jewish donors would commit to only contributing to Jewish universities. The reality is the universities will do just fine without Jewish donations. Anybody who thinks that the leverage that Jewish donors have will decisively turn the tide, I think are mistaken. It would take a much bigger effort than that. Some of the reform is gonna to have to come from a democratic process. Legislatures, my book proposes a number of ways in which legislatures could reinsert enlightenment values. Freedom of speech should be guaranteed in our human rights codes, just like individual equality. Individual equality should be the primary thrust of anti-discrimination laws, not guaranteeing equality of group outcomes. So government has a part to play, but I think the Jewish donor communities should, number one, think about where the next generation of the Jewish community is gonna come from, how people can grow up being affirmingly Jewish in the times that we live in, and the extent that they give to universities, they should only give to what I would call free universities. You know, in the Middle Ages, at the free universities, they were free, right? You could challenge the existence of God, you could challenge the Roman Catholic Church. It's one of the things that led to the Enlightenment. I don't know if there's more or less freedom in 2023 in a, at the Academy than there was in the Free University of Bologna 600 years ago, but there should be. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, you kind of answered my last question. In the midst of these dark times, uh, you propose a path to a lighter future. We have to re-enlighten Canada with the values of the uh, enlightenment, hard work and free speech. Um, you mentioned already a couple of steps that can get us there. Anything else that you want to add? Sorry about w which question? <laughs> <laughs> steps to get us out of our misery, basically, out um, of our current situation. Well, Invest uh, in Jewish let's education. go back to the uh, uh, Jewish community. Um, let me ask you this question, folks. Why? Why be Jewish? It's not easy. Um, as I can say about the winters in Winnipeg, they're character enhancing, and at some point, it's enough character already. <laughs> it's not easy to be Jewish. It never was. 
it's difficult. You have to fight the demoralization of the beautiful people in the wider community demonizing you. Uh, the Jewish community is constantly embattled. Here, the survival of the state of Israel remains, as a physical matter, in question. Some of the reasons you should be think about being Jewish, and, and even in Israel, there's no compulsion about being Jewish. You don't have to believe in God to be an equal citizen of the state of Israel. Doesn't help. Co religious coercion is a really bad idea. The only way Judaism survives is we convince each generation that there's something about it that you want to do. Why would you want to do that? One of the reasons you want to do it is the very reason, opposite of the reason we live in this toxic culture. Because it turns out the human condition is fundamentally scary. It doesn't matter if you have material success, you've got a nice career, everybody loves you. You will die, everybody you know, and, and everything you love will perish. You're still going to have to deal with the question of why you're even here as an individual, why this little rock at the outer reaches the Milky Way is here. What, what are you doing here? A few people can live with the radical existential anxiety. Most people want and need some meaning to their life, need to belong to something bigger, something more enduring. People are naturally religious. They want to belong to something bigger, something enduring, something that gives them a sense of purpose, some sense of justice, some sense of order. Well, that's what we've been doing with Judaism for the last 3,000 years. Judaism is a certain stylization of life. It's an attempt to give a shape and meaning to our existence. A Jewish baby is born, there's a ceremony for that. Somebody passes away, there's prayers that we know, that are familiar. There's a shiva ceremony to comfort the mourners. We're not so sure about the afterlife. We, Judaism, lots of, there's lots of questions as well as answers, but there are contours to your life. There's a framework. Jonathan Sachs wrote about that his life, he thought of himself as writing one more page in the Jewish book. People came before him and wrote pages. He's going to leave a page that people can read after him. Uh, my musical consolation was an attempt to add one more song to the Jewish songbook. Mm -hmm. It was an attempt to actively deploy the Jewish tradition to make my own statement. And hopefully a statement which is connected to the past and somebody in the future will read and will have some resonance. So you belong to something bigger than yourself. And let me tell you, the Jewish religion is a lot more tolerant than the woke religion. <laughs> What's the first thing Abraham does? Just about the first thing? First Jew, he argues with God. In the Jewish Bible, nobody is portrayed as perfect. The heroes are all flawed. There's a prophetic tradition in which people speak truth to power. King David, uh, David Melech Yisrael, a flawed character to say the least. And he's brought up by the prophet Nathan. And he's criticized. He's not portrayed as a perfect person. Nobody has all the answers. Everybody is struggling. What is the Talmud? The Talmud is a record of debates. There's a saying, two Jews, three opinions. There's a good-natured book about the nature of G Israeli society which says, let an Israeli talk long enough, uninterrupted, he'll start arguing with himself. <laughs> the woke religion doesn't have that kind of tolerance. The woke religion is a substitute for many forms of religiosity. But wake up to the woke, folks. You know, you're afraid of traditional Christianity? Who are your friends now? You're afraid of, oh, you don't want to really be Jewish because it's some kind of rigid doctrine? Well, if you actually read the doctrine, if you actually immersed yourself in it, you would see it is a peoplehood and identity of questions and challenges. I wrote an article in the Times of Israel about Ecclesiastes, Kohelet. Kohelet it reads pretty much like a 21st century existentialist. The book of Job is about a human afflicted who is challenging the ways of the supreme creator of the universe. Talmud has lots of questions. There, 
is this myth that all religions believe the same thing. They don't. And I'm not saying what's better or worse. I'm saying there's such a thing as a specifically Jewish identity, a specifically Jewish set of texts, particularly Jewish way of looking at the world. Yeah. You can take it or leave it, but your children and grandchildren should know what it is. Wokeism is all about throwing around abstract language. The Jewish tradition, one of the things that kept it moored in sanity is all those debates discuss the big concepts using practical examples. If you read the Talmud, it's not, uh, what's the distinction between light and dark? It's when do we light the candles? So you're testing all the big ideas in a concrete context. I was in Israel when Rabbi Adin Steinsaltz gave a speech on his 70th birthday, and he talked about the fundamental sanity of the Talmud. And what he meant was, we don't get lost in abstractions, like the woke movement, good, bad, these oppressed, the victims. We think about things in concrete terms, and we argue about them, and we realize life is very complex, but we don't give up. We try and give a form and shape to it. That's what the Jewish tradition is. And I think there's a lot of value to it. I have found being Jewish terribly difficult in all directions. I'm finding it more difficult than I ever have in my life at this moment. I'm not sure we survive, but it would be a terrible loss if we don't, because there is a specialness, not better or worse, but there's a distinctiveness, an identity about the Jewish people, which I think in this crazy world, some people are still gonna wanna belong to. Um, my vision of tradition, light, and hope for Jewish education was connect Judaism to whatever you're doing. You wanna be a doctor? Find out what Judaism had to say about the human body. You wanna be a physicist? Find out why so many physicists are of Jewish origin. Now, Einstein did not believe in the supernatural God, but he sure believed there was some sort of intelligent creator. In fact, at one point, one of his fellow physicists said, Albert, stop telling God what to do. In other words, you should be guided by experimental results and not believe that everything makes sense. But that, the idea that makes sense is a distinctively Jewish idea. So, yeah, what, yeah why do it just because your parents did and your grandparents did it? My late father-in-law, Philip Wise, once told me that he lost faith after the Holocaust. Philip was, by the way, we just brought out the second edition of Philip's memoirs this week. It's called Humanity in Doubt, second edition. Uh, you can get it print on demand from the Amazon. So Philip said he lost faith after he graduated from his fifth or sixth concentration camp. He was at the same concentration camp that's depicted in Schindler's List. And then he said, he said to himself, well, I've seen the terrible things that humanity can do with religion, and I've seen what people do without religion, and it's even worse. Now, communism may not seem like religion. It is, and you can see its <laughs> destructiveness. Wokeism, no doubt wokeism has an overlap with things that every reasonable person should believe in, non-discrimination and stuff, so on, equal opportunity for everybody. Uh, but wokeism, make no mistake, as practiced, is a religion, and like many religions, it's anti-Semitic. I'm pro-Semitic, I'm pro-Jew, I'm not of Jewish extraction, I'm not of Jewish background. Jew, Yid, Yehudi, that's who I am. And the fact that so many kids on campus now are saying things like, I'm of Jewish extract, I'm Jewish background, I'm Jewish butt, what a pathology. You want to not be Jewish? Go ahead. You want to leave the team? Go ahead. But the fact that so many people seem to have to distance themselves, or worse still, become the Spamalot Jews, you know, a Monty Python Spamalot, they have a song, you've got to have a Jew. Yeah, what good is an anti-Israel demonstration without a show Jew? <laughs> yeah, find a Jew who somehow is so battered by the ambient anti-Semitism that they think it's safe to be an anti-Israeli Jew. Uh, yeah, and then you parade yourself as though you're not a fundamentally anti-Jewish movement. Um, that's where we are. It wouldn't be worth doing this Jewish stuff just because we did it. Uh, part of my project in life is trying to find why it's worth continuing. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that was a good point to turn it over to you in the audience. And maybe I can ask uh, Jerry to turn on the lights so that we can see each other, because we know that you are there, but we cannot really see you very well. A little bit more. Maybe can we tone this down a little? 
probably not. Oh yes, thank you, that helps. Oof. <laughs> okay, if you have a question for Brian, uh, Adriana, where are you? Adriana is over here. Please raise your hand and she will come to you uh, with the mic. Adriana, somebody over there. Oh boy, I get the first question, Brian. Um, well, we read today in the free press about a University of Manitoba nursing student who's been suspended for a year for overtly anti-Israel social media posts. And I applaud the university. I'm actually shocked that a university took steps. Do you think that with particular reference to the University of Winni Winnipeg professors, I don't know, Ruth, whether you've investigated their social media posts, but if they've also, if they're also guilty of the same kind of acts, would you recommend to the University of Winnipeg or any other university that they follow suit what the faculty of nursing did? Okay, I, I can't give an answer to that specific case because I think being responsible means knowing all the facts before you give an evaluation. My starting point is I believe in free speech, I believe in free expression. So I would want to have a very good reason why posting an opinion has professional consequence. Uh, the mere fact that you might have a vehemently anti-Israeli position, I still have to know more, right? I would want to know whether you're making the kind of statements that indicate that a Jewish patient wouldn't be safe with you, for example. So merely having non-conforming political views is not enough for me to be professionally disqualified. I say that in my book. In fact, I'm quite concerned about quite the opposite, which is you can't get into a learned profession and can't stay in there unless you follow a certain ideological conformity. I have this, maybe at this point it's an article of faith, <laughs> that if we had an atmosphere of free discussion, the Jewish cause would actually do quite well. If people were actually informed about realities, and I've tried to review some of them in my talk, right? This is what, Israel is a European settler state, suffers from the fact that none of it is true. And if you had an atmosphere where students could hear different points of view, I believe ultimately, ultimately, not in the short run, but in the long run, I don't know, I have maybe what, if I have any optimism at all, it's ultimately that truth will do okay in the long run. That if people actually lived in an academic environment where they heard different points of view, that the cause of Israeli survival is a just one, and that Jews have a lot to contribute mm -hmm. to the world, and have contributed a lot to the world. I don't believe that's the atmosphere in which I live. I've told you about the atmosphere in which I live. I do my program in Israel, and believe me, we don't just have professors. We have all kinds of people from all different kinds of background, and some of them are very critical of Israel. We've had people from Bedouin villages who are Bedouin rights activists very critical of Israel. I've had Arab East Jerusalemites. I've had lots of rather far lefty Jews who are very uh, critical of Israel. I embrace it, I welcome it. The point of my program is not to try and indoctrinate anybody in anything. It's to try and get people to go out there and see for themselves and hear many different viewpoints and have an environment in which people feel free to ask questions, express themselves, and no extra marks for agreeing with me, no extra marks for agreeing with the government of Israel. In fact, last time I was in Israel, at the start of my program, I engaged in a I was in a demonstration against some policies of the government of Israel. If you had a free academic environment in which people could actually learn about the history of the Middle East, I think the cause of Israel would do well. Okay, I keep hearing, pardon me if I'm gonna go on a bit longer. You wanna talk about you know, settler imperialism? Let's talk about imperialism. You know one of the biggest pathologies in the Middle East is? Iranian imperialism. How come nobody ever talks about that? Where, where do you think all this stuff is coming from? <laughs> the Iranian imperialism has been very bad for the people of Iran. It's been very bad for the people of Iraq, where Iran is engaged in a colonial settler project. Hezbollah is a branch plant of Iran. Hezbollah has been devastating to the Lebanese society. Deb Lebanon used to be a pluralistic state, a consociational state, to use fancy language, but many different communities could participate. Uh, it was prosperous, it was free. They used to call Beirut the Paris of the Middle East. 
What has Iran done? What has Hezbollah done to Iran? Anybody ever hear a university prof talk about Iranian imperialism or the Iranian project, which is destroy Israel? You ever heard of Russian imperialism? Ever heard of Islamic imperialism? In terms of the course, the trajectory of world imperialism, about the least imperialist religion you can imagine is Judaism. What does God promise the Jewish people? Hey, they're smallest of all people. What do you get? Israel. That's it. Nobody says you're supposed to take over the world. Judaism is not the proselytizing religion. Judaism believes in the fundamental equality of all people. Judaism always expresses the big ideas through concrete examples. So the idea is Adam and Eve are the forebearers of everyone, which means everybody ultimately has the same ancestry. Judaism never said you're a lesser person because you are not Jewish. If you talk about the Passover Haggadah, a lot of the heroes are non-Jewish. The midwives are probably not Jewish. Mm -hmm. um, Moses gets a lot of his religion from his father-in-law, not Jewish. What, what do we want? Um, we want to be a light under nations, and could we survive in our own homeland, which is Israel? We're not telling everybody else what to think. We're not telling everybody what to do. We're supposed to lead by example. And what do we get? A tiny fraction of the planet, which is Israel. And Israel, from the outset, accepted the two-state solution. The Declaration of Independence of Israel, in the shadow of the foreseeable and known fact that the surrounding Arab states were going to invade it, the Israeli Declaration of Independence says, we want the existing Arab population to stay. We will give you equal civil and political rights, and we want to be friends with our neighbors. So the fraction of Israel slash Palestine that was going to be the state of Israel was a fraction of the fraction, because Israel slash Palestine is a tiny part of the world. And the Jewish people were prepared to accept that tiny fraction. The folks who didn't were parts of the Arab population and the surrounding Arab states who invaded Israel and tried to destroy it. So, but if I can interrupt you, because we got away a little bit from the question. Sure. And I think that there are other questions in the audience. So, who else wants to ask a question? Please raise your hand. Dawn, here, uh, Adriana. I don't know where Adriana went. Dawn wants to ask a question. Thank you. I'd like to take advantage of your law expertise and ask a question about the relationship of free speech and hate speech. It's my assumption that there's something illegal about hate speech and that there's something mandated by human rights uh, declarations about free speech. And uh, I'm always troubled when hate speech is not uh, punished for example, the hate speech that's going on in these demonstrations on the streets and in the university campuses. Can you just give me a, a short course on the relationship of free speech and hate speech? Sorry, so short answer, because if you say course, you know he, he talks a lot. So, uh, Brian, can you answer it oh, to, uh, well, to the, the point? The theory is that your starting point is that free speech is a fundamental human right. Unfortunately, it's not recognized in the Manitoba Human Rights Code, but I wish it was. You have to speak in the mic and a little slower. Yeah, free speech is a fundamental human right. It should be recognized in the Manitoba Human Rights Code, but isn't. In practice, what free speech means at the university is you have the freedom to denounce Israel. Uh, at the same time, if you have, on the woke side, you should never be criticized and you should be free from microaggressions. So I live every day at the university with macroaggressions. Um, but if you're on the other side, then no one should say anything that would possibly hurt your feelings. And in fact, could, could you uh, could yeah. you a microaggression? I don't know if everybody, oops, in the audience is uh, familiar with this particular term. So what, what is a microaggression? Is conduct or speech which not intentionally discriminatory actually makes somebody feel that they've been slighted or offended on the so basis. So you are saying something and you, oh. you mean it very well, but I feel hurt and you have triggered me. So you should shut up or you should be punished. Okay. But um, you want to go around denouncing the right of the Jewish people to self-determination 
or holding events where all you hear from is biased views against Israel, making somebody like me feel jeopardized in every possible way, that's okay. What we need is a principled commitment to free speech, which means you got the right to spew a lot of ignorant stuff about the state of Israel and the Jewish people, and I should have the equal right to argue the opposite point of view, and the equal right to get hired and keep my job at the university, and the okay, equal right of your kids here, here to I want go. to interrupt you, because that you, you, you are now uh, speaking on behalf of free speech, and you feel very passionate about it. Is there also such a thing as hate speech, like Don was asking, yeah, when Supreme, you are across the line? Yeah, according to the Supreme Court of Canada, hate speech is an extreme where you're advocating hatred against an identifiable group and is not merely speech which is offensive. Like I say, you're asking me more of what is the doctrine, I'm telling you more about what the practice is, which is far from principled. Mm -hmm. At the universities, free speech for the woke is not a principle. It is used in strictly instrumental terms. Free speech means you shut up and I can say anything I want. That to me is not a principle. Well, you could argue it's a principle, but it's not a principle that I think is admirable or consistent with the traditions of the university. Okay, thank you. Next question. Hi, Brian. Um, where do I start? Thank you very much for a wonderful talk. This has been very enlightening. Um, but as a, you know, I also am a professor at the University of Manitoba, and I'm the coordinator for Judaic studies. I deal with anti-Semitism these days as almost on a daily basis, counseling students, helping faculty deal with things, and yet we go to the administration over and over again, despite the fact that the president of the university is Jewish, and the major and the vice president for philanthropy is Jewish, and other people in the senior administration are Jewish, we go to them day after day after day with evidence of anti-Semitism by faculty, by students, by staff members. We recently you know, reported a staff member who was posting Israelis equal Nazis on, on, on his Facebook. Um, we have a tone-deaf administration. So what kind of tools do, can we use to change things? So, um the book argues that government should legislate in favor of free speech. It should legislate that universities have to act like universities. It would legislate against ideological litmus tests. For example, the government, the legislature of the United Kingdom has passed a Higher Education Free Speech Act. So they actually have officers in place at the central government level, and every university has to have an, a bureaucrat who's in charge of free speech. Institutionally, there's anti-discrimination officers, there's DEI officers, and empirical studies show Heritage Foundation did a very alarming study of what the actual attitude of diversity, equity, inclusion officers are. If you look at their social media, extremely hostile to Israel. So there's a bureaucracy which in practice is largely staffed by people who are hostile to Israel. And by the way, if you look at the latest draft of the university's DEI policy, doesn't mention anti-Semitism, doesn't mention Jews, because Jews don't count. Um, in terms of the future, um, there needs to be institutions, there needs to be clearly spelled out policies at the university. Not vague stuff, but very specifically, you cannot impose ideological litmus tests on the admission of students. You cannot impose ideological litmus tests on who you're hiring at faculty. Instead, we're going the opposite direction where the institution is increasingly geared up in the woke direction in a direction that is hostile to the presence of Jews and is hostile to Israel. So you have to think, I'm not in terms of principles, I was thinking in response to the last question. People talking about principles, think about the realities. DEI is a big business. The woke industry, the woke educational complex is a big business. You can make a lot of money in it, You can do career advancement, um, the institutional structure has to change. So I, I've made some suggestions that, about that just now. Um, in terms of the Jewish donor community, my suggestion is think about how, where the next generation of Jewish students is coming from and only give to universities that are free universities, which 
would have to meet some of the criteria I just defined. It could not be a place where there's ideological litmus tests to be hired, ideological litmus tests to be admitted, and where Jewish students are not subjected to constant harassment. Okay. So, um, maybe hi. the next question. Yes. Professor on. Schwartz, 20 years ago you taught me law at the University of Manitoba. You taught me a class in the legislative process. I loved your class and I loved going to it every week and I won the award in your class. And then after law school, I worked in the Manitoba legislature. And since then over the last, over a decade, I've taught law at many, many schools, university and college. Uh, you have changed the arc of my life and I'm sure many others. And I wanna personally thank you very much. Uh, you inspired me every week and law can be hard and it can be challenging, and you, you were great for me. Thank you. You did a good job, Brian. <laughs> you do have a purpose. Well, thank you for saying that, because believe me, I'm not getting a lot of positive affirmation <laughs> lately. You, you were just wonderfully inspiring. Uh, Professor Schwartz, something I learned while at the law school and I've taught my students is a case of R.B. Keekstra. Mr. Keekstra was a teacher who spewed anti-Semitism to his students and Holocaust denial, I believe in Alberta. He was hit and charged under the criminal code because he, of hate speech. He argued under section two of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, he had freedom of expression to deny the Holocaust. And it went all the way up to the Supreme Court of Canada, which said basically, yeah, you do have freedom of expression. However, there's section one of the Charter which is a limitations clause. And just to quote the charter, because maybe nobody knows it verbatim. Limitations clause places limits on your right to freedom of expression and other rights. And it says reasonable limits prescribed by law that can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. Professor Schwartz, I have so many questions for you, but one is why aren't there reasonable limits placed on these people spewing anti-Semitism at campus? Why aren't we uh, approaching politicians and saying to them, let's amend the human rights code and put in free freedom of expression along with limitations clauses? Why aren't people going to the human rights code? Because under section nine, subsection two of the human rights code, uh, Judaism is a protected characteristic under both religion and ethnicity. And, and you should be able to challenge your union for those things. Why aren't more people uh, en engaging to champion these causes? What? Well, the disease is partly the reason it's difficult to remedy. It's scary. You want to be the troublemaker who takes on your own union? You want to be the Jewish faculty member who challenges the administration to speak up? By the way, university administrators have free expression too. You don't have to fire people or suspend people, but being a university president doesn't prevent you from expressing an opinion. So. Where are we, who's speaking up? Uh, very briefly, I invite everybody to look at the case of Ed Chemerinsky, uh, University of California, Irvine. He publishes an op-ed piece recently saying, quote, I'm a 70-year-old man and I've never seen anti-Semitism so bad. You can also find a YouTube video where he's broadly hinting that notwithstanding the Constitution of California, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, it's okay to hire people on the basis of group characteristics. Well, what did you think was gonna happen? Ed, you got through at a time when a Jewish person could thrive in academia on the basis of merit. Well, what's gonna happen to your kids and grandkids? So you ask me why, why, why not? Well, all the reasons that it needs to be done are reasons why it's difficult to do. You wanna be an academic and get pillory? Oh, um, this guy's a Zionist, or this guy, oh, I don't know what. Uh, he publishes with right of center think tanks. I have, I publish with about 40 other publishers too. Don't belong to anybody, I don't belong to a party. I've deliberately avoided doing that. Uh, but it's not easy. You know what's easy? Going along to get along. What's easy is, yeah, sure, I don't wanna make a fuss, I just wanna keep my head down, keep my job. Why would I ever stand up and do something controversial? You know, I actually, sincerely, take a lie detector test on this one. I went to the academy largely because I thought it was an environment 
in which you would have a free play of ideas, feel free to express yourself. It's not a safe environment to do that. It's a safe environment to follow the official prevailing doctrine. And increasingly, if you don't want to play the game, you're not going to get in the game in the first place. So the Human Rights Code should respect fundamental freedoms, including freedom of speech. It currently doesn't even mention that. I should have an officer at the University of Manitoba who protects my freedom of speech. We don't. But all those th reasons why they need to be done makes it very difficult to do it. Uh, you know, it's pretty lonely out where I am. The union has made pretty clear, the leaders of the union made pretty clear where they stand. Um, Haskell, you've talked about it's very difficult to get the university to stand up forthrightly. Again, they don't have to censor people and punish people. They could say something. If you're president of the University of Winnipeg, you could say something about events where there's no balance of opinion, where people are talking about things they don't seem to know a whole lot about, but maybe you do, and maybe you could at least invite people to educate themselves. But why would you do that? <clears throat> like, seriously, think about it from the practical standpoint. What's in it for me? I, I want to keep my job. I don't want to be harassed. I don't want to be lampooned. Uh, oh, you know, headline tomorrow, uh, you know, you name it, you're a Zionist. Uh, I'm not going to say out loud you're a Jew, but it's pretty, find some way to insinuate that that's a bad thing to be. Um, yeah, why, you want to get your grant money, you want to go along, you want to get along, why would you possibly exercise your theoretical academic freedom? And again, Jews are not actually powerful, Jews are very vulnerable, which is reason why people with principles should actually be standing up and doing something about what's happening, but they don't, and they won't, because you know what, Jews are not actually powerful. I'm sorry, Ruth, but I have to do my Jewish thing and tell a story. He, he noticed that I was breathing in to interrupt, so yes. It's 19th century Russia, and two Jews are sitting on a bench, and one is weeping, and the other one's laughing, and the guy's crying, he's like, oh, God, I can't believe how bad things are. My son is facing the 25-year draft into the Tsarist army. I'm poor, I'm discriminated against. Uh, they're gonna kill me. And the other one says, I don't know, things are looking good. I just read the protocols of the elders of Zion. And it turns out we control the world. I didn't know that, but cool. Um, no, we don't control the world. We don't control much. There's very few of us left. We are not powerful. Um, that is a myth. We are very vulnerable right now. I can't think of another civilization which is facing extinction the same way our people are. And you would think, I go back to do something hard. It is hard. Like, why would you want to go out there and oppose woke ideology so, and be accused here, of not being enlightened. So here, here I would like to interrupt thing. you, sorry. I will sure. do my Jewish thing, interrupt you. So uh, yeah, I, I think you're a little very pessimistic there and I just want to say that organizations like B'nai B'rit are doing precisely that. You know, um, over the last eight weeks, it has been really tough. I get all the really hard, difficult cartoons. I hear the professors um, talking about uh, of bad about Israel. I see how Jewish students are being kicked off of uh, Zoom conferences because they ask good questions and the professors don't want to answer. And uh, there was a question about University of Winnipeg previously. I am not done with the University of Winnipeg at all. And uh, it is also, so it's hard, I agree with you, it's tough. And um, this afternoon at a demonstration, it, the Palestinian shouting, the chanting, the, the, there were some things said, it got under my skin. However, we have to not let it get under our skin. We are human, so it happens. Too bad, so sad, then tomorrow we is a new day. So we get up and then we are going to be resilient because that's what we have done over the last 3,000 years, Brian. We get up, we are going to be resilient and like you have been, uh, by the way, this is not criticism, don't misunderstand me here at all, because all the stuff that you have done and that you keep doing, despite all the difficulties that you have described tonight, I think it is amazing and uh, you, you also, you don't give up. So we are not giving up and we are holding people to account. That is the thing that the tool that we have at B'nai B'rit, at Jewish advocacy organizations, as Jews, also the organizations that you guys as individuals, to hold people to account. Very often they... <laughs> Very often people don't wanna listen 
sometimes I do not get replies from university presidents. Uh, I am not giving up. I can be a very uh, relentless person if I want to, and they have found that out. This is, this is our tool. We just don't give up, and we keep going, and hopefully, I don't know how I, in that in that, from that perspective, I'm not so optimistic, but hopefully things will turn around somehow. And if not, okay, then this is what it is, and we'll deal with it. So maybe the next question. Um, yeah, I would, uh, I would like some clarification on the efficacy and purpose of uh, the IHRA definition of uh, anti-Semitism. Now this is, apparently has been uh, adopted by Canada and Manitoba, and there are plenty of uh, examples of manifestations of anti-Semitism as described in the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. Why cannot, can't it be used in the uh, in, uh, in criminal prosecutions of uh, promotion of uh, uh, hatred. Well, it can and it could be. So the approach that's taken, for example, in the UK is they consider ERA to be a factor to be taken into account in enforcing their anti-hate law. Now, ERA itself, as adopted by Canada and Manitoba, is not legally binding directly but it is a policy that can be taken into account for purposes such as education and in interpreting other laws. It could be, but it isn't. By the way, you know who else adopted the era definition? The World Council of Imams, mm -hmm. which I believe is the largest uh, Muslim organization of, of Muslim clerics in the world. They adopted era, and all credit to them for doing that. And, and also, if I may say something, it really helped me this morning. When I read yesterday evening, I found out about a letter that Obi Khan had written. So I wrote a letter back to Obi Khan and I said, well, you know, uh, your government a year ago adopted the IRA definition of anti-Semitism. Section 10 says X, this cartoon, I have seen the cartoon of this particular student, uh, is falls really into that category. It is anti-Semitic. So she, you say she's passionate. I think, yeah, she's passionate and she's also spreading hate and we don't need that. So then I had a tool because the government in Manitoba, uh, the, the previous one, uh, the PCs, and he is a PC member, uh, and it was adopted unanimously, it gave me a tool to reply to him and tell him what everybody now, everybody now says, shame on you, Mr. Obika. Yeah, and uh, era can, yeah. <laughs> ERA can and should be used as an educational tool. So if you're president of the University of Winnipeg, how about reading it and saying something? You don't have to shut people down, punish them, ban them. I'm not going to get into individual cases and circumstances, but you certainly want to be president of the University of Winnipeg. How about reading ERA and saying something? How about engaging in educational initiatives so that students who are actually interested can get multiple points of view about the Middle East and not constantly get preached this grotesque anti-Israeli, anti-Semitic line. And again, we should be saying Jew hatred, not anti-Semitism. It's Jew hatred. Mm -hmm. Next question. And maybe the last question. Oh. Uh, there is somebody Hi. here oh. with, uh, or maybe, hello. Okay, yeah, I was asked to, oh. for, to, to join into a newly formed ad hoc committee about five or six years ago, a Haskell, is on the committee and two other uh, uh, sitting uh, uh, professors at the U of M. And the thing is like Judaic studies, there are courses there, but there is no longer a department. And the objective of this is to create community interest and really uh, uh, build, build a, a, or have a, a, a Judaic studies chair, which will then, it'll, in, in uh, perpetuity for future generations, we can also have a strong Judaic studies department. And as you say, Ruth, we keep plugging away and plugging away because it's when you're an ad hoc committee, you don't have any st standing and, and so on, and it's really hard to spread the word out there. And we're thinking of the future generations. Yeah, and again, a lot of the energy that is invested in general causes, all of them worthy, or many of them worthy, should be invested into the Jews, trying to make sure there's another generation of Jews. 
Yeah, and I want to, I, I uh, quoted you that line. There was this guy, his name is Abe Soker, and uh, he is the editor of the Jewish Literary Review, which I can really recommend if you're into that sort of thing. And he said, we cannot control the lies of our enemies, but we can control the character of, uh, and the education of, of ourselves. Yeah, yeah Bernie was referencing the, the case of the nursing student who was suspended in Winnipeg School Press this morning. Um, and, yeah, and, and she specifically stated, uh, as I cited it after I looked it up, uh, one included a controversial cartoon uh, equating the actions of the Israeli military to those of Nazis during the Second World War. Uh, this clearly fulfills, I would think, fulfills the IRA definition of anti-Semitism. And uh, could you advance it forward in terms of uh, considering something that you could uh, arraign for as a hate law? Sorry, I didn't hear the last. That you can indict for a hate law, as a hate law. Well, you can't go directly from IRA to violating Canada's anti-hate laws. Anti-hate laws have very specific definitions, willfully promoting hatred. And even some really obnoxious, discriminatory, ignorant, vile speech is not necessarily hate speech. So I would like to see a consistent world in which there's a principled commitment to free speech subject to certain constraints at the outer limits, not the world I live in. The world I live in, like I say, is not a principled commitment to free expression and academic freedom. It's a utilitarian one. I will favor academic freedom if it's good for my politics, but not if it's good for your politics. Yeah, well, that's one of the... And you should be able to live in an environment of free expression where you can say there's some parts of the Koran which express unacceptable views with respect to Jewish people. There are other parts of the Koran which are positive. People are free to interpret them. But we should have an atmosphere of free expression in which you can debate things. You should be able to criticize traditional Jewish doctrine and traditional Muslim doctrine and traditional Christian doctrine. And if there's parts of the Koran which are troubling, you should be able to say that's a troubling part. How is it interpreted nowadays? There's, believe me, there's lots of stuff in the Jewish scriptures which are troubling. And we spent the last couple thousand years reinterpreting them and modifying them and, and reforming them. Um, you, should not, you should be free to cite the Koran. And you should be free to interpret it in the way you want as your starting point. And other people should be feel free to express concerns about what are some of the implications are in terms of hatred of the Jewish people. There's different ways to interpret the Koran. There's different ways to put it in context. We should have an atmosphere in which people are not afraid to, to discuss that. There's troubling parts of the Koran which potentially can be used by jihadist movements. Other parts that are actually quite positive. People are free to interpret it in a different way. Then we should live in a free society where you can debate that without fear. I, we're not going to win a debate about censoring this or censoring that. The only prospects for the survival of Jewish people is a return to a society in which people are free to express themselves. You can actually debate things. And the hope is, as John Adams said, John Adams, second president of the United States, the hope is that facts are stubborn things which will ultimately prevail in the face of passion and prejudice. The facts are, as I've discussed, Israel is not a fundamentally racist enterprise. Israel is not, in fact, a European colonial emanation. Um, there's a lot of falsehoods out there. We're not going to win the censorship debate. The best hope is actually return to the traditional values of free debate, free expression, the belief that the academic life is the search for the truth, and that the classroom is a place where people can hear all kinds of different points of view. Uh, there is no prospects that you're going to shut down all of the hatred against the Jewish people by using the tools of censorship. The only hope, if there is a hope, is that in an atmosphere of renewed free expression, actual commitment to intellectual life, that the truth will ultimately prevail. And the truth is nothing like some of the stuff we're hearing. It, it is just a lie. It's not even in a matter of opinion that, for example, Israel is a European colonial settler state. Okay, I think um, that kind of sums it up for tonight. Oh, one more question, sure. I, I just had one thing to ask. Uh, you know, free expression is very important in society. And university particularly, that's how young people 
learn how to become uh, the successful contributors to society in the future. But there is no place, in my opinion, on university campuses or in the public uh, to spew hate. And I think that maybe one thing that we're forgetting, we have a certain amount of power that we just don't ex exhibit all the time. Um, when there's financial consequences for people's actions, uh, sometimes when they have to pay a price, a dear price, for saying or doing something, they sometimes learn a lesson and others may learn from that as well. What I'm talking about, as that, as that uh, student has learned, there is a consequence for your action. If there are university professors, if there are students who are enunciating extreme, negative, hateful, unfounded comments against Jewish people or anybody else for that matter, there should be some kind of action. I believe our people could meet with the Premier, could meet with the Minister of Education. We are the ones financing the university. Yes, there are private donations, but they are small in comparison to the overall budget of the university. So therefore, I think it has to become more clear. You really can't just do whatever you want. You are being paid by the government of Manitoba. And guess what? All of us are paying our taxes mm -hmm. to fund that government and that education. So just before we go, Ruth, I, I have a sense we're coming to an end. To the end. Yeah. All beginnings are difficult, all endings are difficult. Yes. Uh, I'll say one last thing. As I said at the beginning, I spent my life trying to do, light candles as well as cursing the darkness. Uh, as a Jewish person, I have spent a lot of emotional energy playing uh, defense. Um, I'm trying to do a lot of positive stuff as well. So you're just hearing a fraction of what Brian is doing. You can visit my website, sacredgoof.com. Free downloads of my musicals and stuff. You can read my Vision, Light, and Hope, <laughs> Vision for Jewish Education. You can read about the Mishpatim program. I just wish to live in a world in which, uh, as a Jewish person, you could devote your energies to Jewish continuity in a positive way instead of constantly being on the defensive, which is where we are right now. Great way to end the evening. Thank you guys so much for coming out. Wow, uh, Brian, thank you so much for doing this. I don't know about you, but for me, this is, you know, such a breath of fresh air after all the stuff that you see on the news and what has happened over the last eight weeks. Uh, it is difficult stuff that you talked about and uh, how hard it is to, to remain standing in this environment. But at the same time, we, I'm, I'm, I think I'm speaking on behalf of everyone, we have learned a lot from you tonight. And uh, everybody, read Brian's book. Uh, do check out his website. He has many brilliant ideas, many brilliant programs. And uh, yeah, just uh, thank you for coming and have a safe ride home. Thank you.